Maybe we should yes. tell the quick story of uh, um, Prun. Yeah. Uh, I, I was commissioned to write a book about Paris, but actually it wasn't, there's no Eiffel Tower, or anything else uh, that most tourists go to. Just stories of neighborhoods, neighborhood stories, because you guys like that idea. And Prun, I was doing a section on Canal Saint-Martin. Uh, Saint there was a, a really raucous evening there and a guy had too much to drink. And so, he went up to the bar and asked for a, 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 a hot wine. And the bartender, Christophe, told him, uh, sorry, I can't serve you. So he said, if you don't serve me, I'm gonna jump in the canal. Now, you guys, who know Paris, what do you think the bartender told him? Jump Good in jump the canal. In the canal. <laughs> go ahead. He said, go ahead. And he did. He jumped in the canal. Pete, the patrons went over there and pulled him out and bought him a, a hot wine. The fire department came and was furious with the bartender for letting that happen. So he got in trouble. So. I don't know who the winner is in this situation. Maybe it's the guy who jumped in the canal. But uh, that's, a, that's a Paris bar story for you. And what year do you think that happened? Well, that had to be, let's see, the book was written in 2006, so that had to be about 2003, 2004. Okay. So we're not talking ancient history. Here. No, no, yeah. but I'll give you yeah. some ancient history yeah. any moment here. Okay. And, and one thing we need to know about this canal is yeah. that for many years, it was a place where down and outers hung out. It was not, there were no bike paths. It was just a, not a, a seedy place. Right. And so there's been a lot of literature about that. Edith Piaf wrote a song about that, sang a song about that, mm -hmm. classic song. Uh, and then there's a hotel we're gonna see there, here called Hotel du Nord. Yeah. And the North Hotel. And there was a novel and then later a, a film, 1936, written about that hotel, the life about the, difficult life of the inhabitants of the neighborhood. And um, I'll tell you the rest of the Hotel de Nord story when we actually see the hotel, because yeah. you'll see a story of gentrification. What was, do you know the name of the Edith Piaf song? Les Mômes, Les Mômes de... Paris? No, no, Les Mômes de... Uh, yeah. <laughs> something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll have to look it up. Yeah. Uh, Mom is like a street urchin. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Cool. Okay, let's get introductions all around. My name's Alan, and I lived in Paris for 23 years, but have been back in the U.S. for the last 10 years, and I'm here for a six-week stay. Fantastic. Doing work and seeing friends, and my daughter and her husband moved here about a year ago. Fantastic. And what sort of work do you do? I deal in uh, Asian art. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you so much. And we're gonna, you're going to be chatting and contributing to some of the lore and some of the stories, I understand. Happy to join in. Yeah, fantastic. The best biking city I've ever experienced. Okay, very good. And whereabouts in the States are you again? In uh, Santa Monica. Oh, in Santa Monica. Near very LA. Good. Back in good my old- Good biking there too. Yeah, back in my old stomping grounds. Step on up here, uh, Mark, and uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Well, uh, like Alan, uh, I have 23 years in, in Paris. Mm -hmm. But mine is continuing, yep. ongoing. Uh, I'm just outside of Paris in Clichy. Mm -hmm. Uh, where Henry Miller once lived. Yep. And I've been commuting, actually all of my commuting for 15 straight years. Mm -hmm. I was doing gigs all around the region and every single day, rain or shine, I did my commuting on bike. Yeah. Uh, it was a mission of mine. Yeah. And I feel that there was a mission accomplished. And what I saw, the changes in bicycle uh, infrastructure from when I began to now are incredible. So that's the story that I have lived. Very good, very good. And who are you? Hi, I'm Dr. Billy Fields from Texas State University, and I'm along for the ride, excited to see the streets of Paris and experience them in person. Fantastic, and, and yes, literally we mean along for the ride because we are all on our bikes, and so this is going to be a short little bike tour. Very good. And right. that's the organization that I belong to. Fantastic. Bicycling adv advocacy. Yeah, all right, let's nice. do it.
you guys see the circular drawbridge there? What's that? The circular drawbridge. This is a circular drawbridge right here? Yeah. Oh, all right. Very cool. I didn't notice. John, there's a number of projects over in this neighborhood for the greening of Paris yeah. uh, that we need to go check out. Really interesting projects where they've taken the street and taken parking away and added green space to straight into the street. Okay. Well, point them out as we, if yeah. we happen to be rolling right by it. This, this here, plus where you see the turret down there, mm -hmm. is the San Luis Hospital, Hospital San Luis, which is the second oldest hospital in Paris. And the innovation was one of the, the, the actually the first urban planner of Paris was King Henry IV mm -hmm. in the early 1600s. So the style, of this hospital mm -hmm. is the same as the style in Place des Vosges, uh, which is a big tourist place, but nobody comes to see this hospital, mm -hmm. but it's the same style as uh, also Place Dauphine, which is on an aisle in the Seine, mm -hmm. and he also did uh, Pont Neuf mm -hmm. in 1604. All of that is around 1604. If you look at Place des Vosges, you can see the urban planning involved there. Uh, but uh, over here, uh, it was basically to uh, the first time they had a public hospital. It was the, I, the whole idea of public health was initiated uh, by Henry IV <laughs> uh, when he built this hospital. Fascinating, right. fascinating. Alan, is this uh, these some of the neighborhoods that you remember from your time here? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Paris is not that big a city. In fact, you can walk from one end to the other. It's yeah. not out of the question. And uh, it's uh, you know, just so rich, the life and the streets and the architecture and people, and especially when it's nice and everybody's out on, uh, on the yeah. sidewalk and the cafes. It really comes to life. But I would say there are only about 70 days of sunshine in Paris, which is, is pretty, it is? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. kind of <laughs> depressing when you think of it. We're, we're kind of lucky today. We, we had a little bit of rain um, first thing this morning, and uh, it was really, really cloudy. But if we look down this street right here, we've got some beautiful uh, blue sky that's coming up, and you've got our clouds rolling through. One of the things I wanted to mention about this the, the street that we just came down and this little intersection that we're in here is just how quiet it is. And the fact that, you know, yes, there's a couple of cars that have come through since we've been here, but they were moving very, very slowly. These, these side streets, these areas away from the major boulevards where there's lots and lots of cars, it's just so much quieter and, and so pleasant. Yeah, and we hear the sound of people, which is yeah. the nicest sound. And birds as well. And was this the Paris that you remember when you lived here? I mean, was, oh, it, was it calm like this then yeah. too? Oh, very much so, yeah. Okay. Except it wasn't bike friendly at all. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's a huge transformation. And I guess one of the, the, the key things that we see when we swing the, the, the camera around and we look at this street here is again, there's, there's not much in bike friendliness other than, you know, we do see some bikes, you know, sort of par parked here, but it's just a traffic calmed environment. It's a shared space where the cars are driving slower. What's the real big revelation, I think, is what you're saying is that there are bike lanes where we really need the bike lanes. And then we've got the quieter shared streets where we're able to ride and mix with cars. Yeah. And in fact, we're privileged more so than cars. Yeah. On this street, we can walk, even though it's one way, mm -hmm. we can bike in the opposite direction. Right. Completely right. legal. Yeah. Thoughts, Professor? Well, I, I rode across the city yesterday, yeah. uh, and speaking to the Paris being small, uh, mm -hmm. it was amazing. I started right on the edge of the city and then rode across the whole city with my luggage in the bike share bike mm -hmm. uh, and really exp at, at rush hour and experienced yeah. the full breadth of uh, Paris. And there are these beautiful side streets that are slow and peaceful, but then 
there's a dance that's happening on the other streets. Much more activity, but the new uh, cycle tracks really provide a space for you to be. And so it's possible, even at rush hour, even with all your baggage, to, to cross the city. And there were moments where I was a little concerned, uh, but I just went along with the dance and it worked. I like that, the dance yeah. on the street. Okay, Mark, what's our next one? So, okay, so I think we're gonna go against the, against the flow here. Okay and then make a left to the canal so, so you can get a better view of the hospital okay. right down there. Let me switch bikes out here. Yep. Yeah, as long as we're here. So as we turn right there, we should see the Hotel du Nord. Okay. And I can tell you the story of that and, and the, the freeway that it was almost built mm -hmm. to cover the canal. Yeah. So on this particular street, from an infrastructure perspective, they've got us in a little bike lane and sort of identified. Is this a one-way street the opposite direction it's a one -way for cars? Street the opposite so, this, so that's intended as a contraflow. So when you're on a bike and you're coming up this other direction, you're you're in with the, right. the cars. Right. I was always wondering kind of what the logic was. Oh, that's, that's and that, that makes a lot more sense that that's what's happening there. So I, I can't explain it because I'm yeah. not an expert. Yeah. But I can definitely testify that on the contraflow streets, mm -hmm. I feel safer. Yeah. I feel safer. I can yeah. see what's coming at me, mm -hmm. and uh, as opposed to hearing a motor groaning behind me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and what's also interesting, too, is and if we look up the hill here, we see that this is a pretty steep hill. And so, yeah, it's a contraflow, and I don't know, that you know, that's kind of an interesting thing, is to think that, so on a bike, you're going up the hill and you're with the traffic. Um, is the is the law and or the custom that if you're on a bike that the the driver needs to be patient and not I, I, not you pressure you? That's that's amazing. But I think that the, you look at the driver, he looks at you, mm -hmm. and somebody has it's to move. And most of the time, it's the bicycle rider who who tries to move out of the way. It depends. On, on the way the space is organized. Uh, but um, Because it, it is kind of an interesting thing to have a contraflow lane downhill mm -hmm. going at speed right. while the bikes and the, pe and, the, uh, and the car drivers are going uphill. Right. Because typically that would be difficult for us on a, on a bike to get up the hill. All right, there's so many yeah. ups and downs starting in this neighborhood that yeah. Yeah, you, can't, yeah. you can't plan things into it. Yeah, yeah. All right, we're rolling, gents. Yeah. Okay, so this is Hotel du Nord, and um, after there was a novel, 1920s, and a film, 1936, about the uh, down and outers who lived in the neighborhood, and it was called Hotel du Nord, the North Hotel. Uh, it became a landmark, but the uh, urban, re urban renewal people wanted to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And so that was in the 50s, 60s. So the people formed a human chain mm -hmm. and prevented it and saved the hotel. Mm -hmm. The uh, people in the neighborhood Def, uh, were the ones who, uh, you know, their activism, it was spontaneous activism. I don't know if they had any organizations. We just, everybody said, hey, they're going to tear this down. Let's get together. And they blocked it. At the same time, the canal itself, in the 1960s, uh, some idiots wanted to make a highway and get rid of the canal. Mm -hmm. And again, there was a neighborhood uprising, as well as some city officials who said this is a crazy idea. Mm -hmm. And they prevented that from happening. Uh, otherwise, uh, this would be a, a, a non-space or dead, dead space. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
but the, the difference here is that the Hotel du Nord, if you take a look at it, you will see that at the time of the film in 1936, there were pr pr mainly down and outers and hard knockers who were hanging out here. And now it is an incredibly upscale type of uh, place. Uh, mini gentrification going on part of the street. So John, you can do now a series of places looking at where canals were filled in mm -hmm. and where canals basically stayed and opened up to people again. And this, right. is, that, this is that story in Paris. Right. But in Amsterdam, you have the single canal that they wanted to pave over and put a highway and they, they fought back and didn't. But in Utrecht, where they actually did pave, pave over and then it came back and they added the canal back. Right really interesting stories of place and recovery. Right. And then in, in Seoul, South Korea, yeah, they, did the they got rid of a highway there and they made a canal instead of it and now it's a green space for the public, so. Yeah. yeah. All right, Mark, what's the next stop on the tour? Uh, well, very near here, uh, you'll see a place where the canal, an engineering feat, the canal is actually higher than the street. The water level is higher than the street. Ah, fabulous. We'll get there in a moment. And this is also the, uh, one of the first places in Paris prior to Anne Hidalgo when uh, uh, the city of Paris, Mayor de la Noé, initiated the Car Free Sundays. This was maybe the first place where they had the car free Sundays. Ah. Yeah, right there, you can see it, right where the curve is. You can see the water of the canal is actually higher than the road. Yeah, that's a pretty, pretty uh, fancy little feat of engineering right there. Yeah, yeah. and this was, that's about 1926. Mm -hmm. This is actually the third uh, canal that was built. Mm -hmm. We're heading, as we go ahead, we're going to go into Canal de Lourdes. Okay. Uh, which was uh, one of the earlier canals, and you'll see another tr city transformation happening there. Right, okay, very good. Let's go check it out. Again, just so cool to see so many kids, their parents out on bikes in the city here. We're on our little uh, canal tour here with Mark Kramer. Uh, while we're waiting, yeah. um, the part of the canal we did not look at, just prior to Cheikh Khun, mm -hmm. the canal actually goes underground and it comes up as it arrives at the Seine. Uh, so there's a park, parkway above the canal. Yeah. I'm not sure if other cities have had under, underground canals. Yeah. This is one of the main locks of the canal. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jacques Brel wrote a song called Les Éclusiers, mm -hmm. which are the canal operators, an ancient craft. Uh, what I understand is now they're operated by technology and there's nobody there. But in villages, you can still find the old Éclusier who open, open the water and close the water to let the boats through. I'm hearing sound. What do we have going on here? Oh, we've got the water. Here's a boat coming through. Yeah, so we've got this boat coming through. Yeah, they're filling up the lock, so it could go to the That next. was one of the rationale for mm -hmm. keeping the canals, mm -hmm. was that, okay, some of the industrial transport was no longer going through there, but we could put uh, tourist boats 
in there and that could make the canal viable. And that was one of the arguments they made for keeping the canals. Right. Originally, these canals had two purposes. Mm -hmm. One was to bring water uh, into Paris mm -hmm. as the population increased. And the other, with this Canal de Lourdes and Canal Saint-Denis, uh, Saint mm -hmm. the purpose was to reroute the boat traffic so it didn't go through the center of Paris, so mm -hmm. it didn't destroy the ambiance. Right. Uh, but now, of course, these things are transforming. Fantastic. And this is an old industrial zone that has been transformed, transformed into a place to be uh, for, for people who like to hang out. Yeah. One of the great hangouts of Paris is right along this canal here. Yeah. They made a movie theater here. We'll walk by there yeah. so you can see what they did to this. It didn't exist when I first came here. Right. So you have the bike paths parallel to the canal and you mm -hmm. also have the um, towpath where you can ride on the towpath as well. Okay. And if we swing back over here, we can see our water levels. Equalizing. And it looks like this is a stepped process, so we've got a gate right up ahead, too. Yeah, Paris has all of these delights. You can find areas of Paris where you step into 100 years ago. Yeah. My favorite restaurants are the ones that are literally unchanged, uh, you know, with the passage of time. Yeah. And so you have this uh, time capsule effect in, in many individual spots and many streets that look totally unchanged. And in fact, 100 years from now, Paris might not look very different than it does now, yeah. which is kind of a, a refreshing thought for me, who yeah. loves history and old things. It's amazing. Yeah. The before and afters, there's basically, when you look at the, bef the before on mm -hmm. Google, there's right. just car parking right. all over the side. And right. then you see here, they've opened up space. And then the next section that we just went through, right. there's the green space and the kids games. All of that is happening, not just on this two to three block area, but in right. hundreds of places across Paris. Yeah. And it's, it's really transformative. Yeah. This school streets program is just, it's amazing. Yeah. Mark, we're talking about the relevance of what we just rolled through, the school streets program. A big part of uh, your work, Billy, also includes uh, uh, that greening aspect uh, as well. Why don't you talk a little bit about that relevance of what we just saw? Yeah. So. The greening does two things. They're adding, they're basically making it safe for walking and biking. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they're adding green space. And that's really what a resilient street is. A resilient street is a safe place for walking and biking, decreasing your greenhouse gas emissions, and then adapting your street to different climates. Mm -hmm. And so adding this, the green space reduces the urban heat island impact. It soaks up water. And when you strategically do that in multiple places, mm -hmm. you really create a lot of resilience for the city. And the, the yeah. interview that I, I was in uh, with the city of Ivry yesterday, mm -hmm. their which is just outside of Paris, they're strategically adding those elements into their planning right. in the same way that the city of Paris is doing here. Right. Uh, and it's all about green space and water and opening up on the, the days where it's really hot in Paris, mm -hmm. uh, where people have a place to go where it's cooler. Right. Uh, and they're doing it all across the whole region, which is really amazing. This has been fabulous. And I'm really glad we came down here. This is just amazing. Well, in the rain garden aspect of this, you can see how the water soaks it up. Yep. If I were to probably do any one thing to criticize this and, and say is, is just less asphalt, I would have done permeable pavers through right. here right. To, to really soak up even more water and, and also help with the heat island effect too, getting rid of that black concrete. You're noticing here they decided to use a lighter material as well. Hey, Billy. Yeah. I'm just uh, commenting on how it seems like they could have done a little bit better in their approach there of not using the black asphalt and done a, a cooler material like they have in here. Yeah. To the point that, you know, bringing that heat island effect down 
you know, kind of really, you know, the lightening the materials up really helps. And you can feel it in here, how yeah. different it is when you just change the material. Yeah. The switch from asphalt is a, is a challenging one. A lot of communities are just sort of stuck in doing that over yeah. and over again. Yeah. It looks to me here, and I don't know the answer, uh, it looks to me like they budgeted for just a smaller space. Yeah. And then they kind of had the one small section of asphalt just yeah. as kind of uh, an addition to it. Well, absolutely beautifully done. Yeah. Mark, thank you so much for showing us around here today and the lock. And great timing with the lock masters. That was fantastic. Uh, got to see the boat, you know, be able to, to get down the, that lower level. And brilliant move having us turn up this way uh, to the School Street area. And, uh, and Alan, thanks so much for mentioning too about um, the plaques that are around, uh, you know, much of many of the schools, you're really com commemorating, uh, you know, those people who, uh, well, I'll let, I'll let you say that again, just to so make sure to get it right. Yeah, well, France uh, was invaded by Nazi Germany mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, basically a puppet government was installed. Mm -hmm and the Nazi racial laws were in force, so uh, Jewish families were uh, often arrested and deported to concentration camps, including yeah. children. Yeah. And uh, the schools, of course, have a record of you know, all students, so they could do this in a kind of official way. Right, yeah. And then, of course, there was the active uh, resistance to the Nazi German. Yeah. So each of the schools now have a, a, a plaque to yes. try to commemorate yeah, that. that. Yeah. Happened, yeah. Uh, it was quite a few years before yeah. France even took some blame for this collaborationist government, sure, sure, which right. was actually headed by a World War One uh, hero, right. uh, yeah. Patin, the uh, the general who was responsible in large part for France's uh, victory in World War One. Yeah, yeah. But he became the the puppet head of yeah. uh, Nazi-controlled yeah. uh, uh, France at the yeah. time. Yeah. And the government capital was actually moved to Vichy, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is a spa in the south of France. So it was called the Vichy government. Okay. Fascinating, fascinating history. Billy, bringing us down to modern times, we rolled past that school and I, could, I didn't have you on camera, but I could just feel your big, huge grin just going. Talk a little bit about what we just saw there. Yeah, the school street program to me is the most exciting thing going on in Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, what you've seen in Paris is adding lots of cycle tracks and bikeways, but now it's moving into neighborhoods and they're taking these small kind of you know, Paris streets are all twisty and turny. They're taking some small twisty turny streets, particularly in front of schools, and greening them and adding play spaces. And this is an example that we just saw of how that process is taking place. And it's only two or so blocks, mm -hmm. but that two or so blocks happens in a hundred or so locations across Paris. Right. And when you do that, you transform neighborhoods, you connect into those cycle tracks, and all of a sudden you have this network of safe spaces for people to travel. And then the second part is they're really adding that green space. And the uh, safe active travel plus green space equals resilient streets. And that's really what you see here in Paris developing. Fantastic, that's great. Final thoughts on, on what we've seen today. Well, I would say, uh, you know, as I said, I haven't been living here for 10 years now, although I have come back rarely to visit. But uh, even in the last 10 years, it's been a huge transformation in terms of getting around the city by bike. Yeah. And uh, it's complete, to me, bikes are privileged. Yeah. Over cars, over even buses. Yeah. <laughs> and that is a huge uh, change from yeah. the past. And you're in Santa Monica now, and uh, you're seeing, you know, Santa Monica is, is working to become more bike friendly as well. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah there are painted, they're not uh, separated bike lanes like many of them here, but it's a very uh, easily viewed uh, green, almost a fluorescent green yeah. paint. I believe that Santa Monica was the city that pioneered the quick build of a protected bike lane, which is fantastic. It, it, it went all around the world in terms of a meme. Uh, so if I find that, I'll have to send oh, it to you please. because it'll Good. probably be maybe a street that you don't ride as frequently there in Santa Monica. So I'll, I'll be sure to follow up Good. with you on that. Mark, um, thank you so much for, for coordinating in this and getting this together. Final thoughts from you about yeah, some of the um, things that we saw. I, I'd like to mention 
that the picture you're taking right now mm -hmm. is the after picture. Mm -hmm. The before picture of this area 20 years ago yeah. was really a down and out uh, poor neighborhood. What I am seeing, I have this ongoing discussion with, a, with an urban historian, a mm -hmm. uh, friend of mine, Scott, who says that Paris inevitably is all gonna become gentrified. Mm -hmm. But what I see around here is that they are able to make improvements in the neighborhood, make it a good place to be, to feel, and yet uh, they're, they're not gentrifying. Mm -hmm. They're partly, like I call it, mini gentrification with the Hotel mm -hmm. de North. Mm -hmm. They're able to keep the people into the neighborhood, not push them out. Right. And uh, that's really important because that's a hard thing to do. Right. To, to make a place fun to be in yeah. and worth loving, but not, not gentrifying it. Right. And I'd like to, to point out that when we, when we look at, at neighborhoods and, and, and cities, that are, are they're kind of down and out and, and really do need to be gentrified, really do need to be come, come back, we need to realize that, that that concept of gentrification doesn't need to be negative. The negative aspect of gentrification typically is that there's displacement. And so what you're saying is that they were able to, you know, bring this along and improve it and, and take care of some of that deferred maintenance that didn't take place and then help to make sure that there wasn't the displacement. Yeah, if you want to buy an apartment, uh, this is the least expensive neighborhood in Paris right now. Boom, there's a, yeah. there, there's a, uh, there's a nice, good real estate tip. Uh, I don't know, you know, what do you think, Billy? Final thoughts from you, Billy. And, and just to follow up on what we were just talking about, yeah. in, in the book Adaptation Urbanism that I wrote, mm -hmm. we looked at what resilience is, and it's right. a compact city with safe transportation, green infrastructure like we've seen on this, and then in terms of equity, it's vital when you create these type of places to create uh, affordable housing. And I think right. that's the story that you're starting to see in places like this, that when you begin to create these uh, really lovely places, it puts a little bit of pressure on housing costs. Right. And then working on the affordable housing and the affordable housing side is important. And I know that the city of Paris and then Ivory yesterday where I was have, has done that. So I've, I've seen those components of what a full resilient city starts to look like. Right. And, and you can see it around it here it's yeah. it's lovely and then just to kind of conclude what we talked about earlier was that all of this was planned to be a highway right. and you imagine this as a highway yeah. imagine a highway here instead of this lovely place for people right. uh, and so I, I think that's that's really a takeaway for me I didn't know that mark when uh, when you told me that story it's, yeah, that it's really powerful really but, powerful and right now the canal will work I'd like to uh, really stress it goes out to um, a beautiful Parc de la Vivette, mm -hmm. and then it goes by another neighborhood that was decrepit, which has been restored, and then it goes out for 55 kilometers into the country, or you go left to the Canal Saint Martin, which is also a, a no man's land, mm -hmm. and now is a place to be which is worth, yeah. worth visiting. Yeah. Uh, and I, I like to say, if I can put in a plug here, yeah. uh, this book, has stories of all around the region. Mm -hmm. Most of them are happy endings, but right. some of them are not, yeah. where they've been able to um, uh, make life worth living for the people who live there and uh, getting to know those places by bicycle. Fantastic, that's great. Hey everybody, I hope you've enjoyed this little tour and history ride around Paris and the canals. Thank you all so much, and until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. Yay! Fun. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up, and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.